to her question and her request, everyone. What? I don't know. What do you want? Wednesday or Friday? Wednesday or Friday? Wednesday or Friday? Friday. It's Friday. You want me to do a review for class too? Fine, I'll consider doing that. Perhaps on Wednesday. Uh, God, <laughs> this is awful. All right, so uh, pursuant to that, if you're looking, I, because I wasn't sure, I didn't have my university computer functional at home because I left my, my cord, my power cord at school Monday. I felt lousy Monday. So I, I posted, I, I did it this morning and did this. So if, if there was any trouble listening to it, it's here now at the bottom of week two. And then I'll put the remaining information here as we continue with viruses. Today's kind of an interesting viral day because we get influenza and we get, we start with COVID. I'm sure we get an HIV and then there's not a whole lot left out of viruses. There's some interesting stuff that viruses do vis-a-vis -vis tumors. And, and that kind of stuff. And then we're done with that. So yeah, I can, I'll, I'll be, I'll be glad to do that. User friendly. I was looking for the wedding pictures from the sword arch for my kid back 10 years ago, but oh, it's, it's too hard for me to navigate. I'll, I'll get my daughter-in-law to do that. Who's coming up this weekend for the wedding since my son would have been the best man, but you know, it's, it's hard to get back from somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean. <laughs> go figure. Here we go. So there's not, I mean, there's not a whole lot to see PowerPoint wise. We're going to start with this and that is the coronavirus. So we might as well, it, because it's so topical. The interesting thing about these RNA viruses, particularly when they affect multiple species, I just want to make sure about something here. When they affect multiple species like these do, yeah, we're recording and everything's good, is that they can basically occupy different species. So there's a phenomena that really is kind of how COVID developed and the mutation. So, and the viruses we've seen this in are particularly influenza, and the coronavirus COVID-19. And, and as you can see, there have been a couple of other players. For years, coronaviruses were a respiratory virus that affected a number of species, including ourselves. And they were really more of like a cold presentation. But since roughly 2002, we've seen something called SARS, COV-1, versus SARS CoV2, which is the current, you know, which is COVID-19. And you can see from this power, this particular PowerPoint, they didn't even have it on the books yet. Cause it was about this probably went, you know, probably was published about 20, 2018 or so this particular text before the outbreak. So we had something called SARS, which was noted because it had folks had gotten on a plane, I think in Japan ended up in Canada and a bunch of people died. But somebody obviously had a very contagious form of what, then was considered a novel virus. When you see the term novel virus it means new, not previously encountered. And really the way that they are put together is because we have fragments from multiple species that have somehow magically come together. And then we saw another variant of this, which was, which was just present when we saw some outbreaks of it, though limited at the World Cup in what they predict we around here call it Qatar. Most people call it gutter or gutter. And that was MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which we noted to be present when we had a lot of our military were in, were, were in the Iraq and Iran and related to the Middle Eastern theater of war. So those were both basically novel kinds of viruses. What does it mean? So effectively, this is, it depends on who you're going to believe and how you think it came about, but effectively, whether it was created in a laboratory and magically escaped a la the, the, the very famous novel by Stephen King called The Stand, which had been made into movies or TV shows on a couple of, a couple of times where we get this, this deadly virus that escapes from a laboratory for whatever reason, whether nefarious intentional or non-intentional, or whether it came from a very large open air market with a lot of species got together. 
So effectively, and this is the same way what happens when we see some of the killer strains of influenza, where it will occupy us or it'll, it'll be at a farm and you'll have pigs and you'll have cows and you'll have horses and you'll have uh, a variety of fowl, whether it's ducks, whether it's chickens and all together, you'll have simultaneously maybe two different strains of the flu occupying yet another species. So you get a phenomenon which we'll learn about called antigenic shift, where a section of the genomic or gene material, the RNA, moves from one species to another and actually flourishes in yet a third species. And you'll see that. And then there's a couple of illustrations in these texts that'll demonstrate that. So because we know, and I was just uh, taking a quick glance, if you got in here a, a little bit earlier, I mean, they, they see bat uh based genomic material that's associated with bat COVID and bats are a notorious player in this because bats are mammals and it's an e relatively easy exchange in mammalian types of things. Bats are, you know, you want to, you want to stay away from them if you can if possible. They're very interesting and they're interesting to follow and what they do scientifically for a lot of, a lot of folks look at them, but one of the problems we begin to see this association with bat genomic material with certain strains of both influenza and now COVID. So that's really what has happened. We see an unusual occurrence. Let's say it happened in this market in Wuhan, which has a, a, a well, very, very well-known food market. And you have all these different species and some of the animals are sick and some of the animals are not. And, and they're in close proximity to each other. It's a respiratory virus. Okay. So they're just like you and I are coughing, they're coughing. It goes, goes from one to another. And then yet now you have an, now you might have two different strains of this occupying yet a third species. And now magically you get this interaction where genetic material is actually not only shared, but becomes incorporated with it. And that creates something that's new or unique that our immune systems cannot handle. And the damage is done by the immune systems. What we think, and I, I did a couple of presentations on this from some research when we had the first lockdown, which is pushing next month, three years, where what they were seeing was that respiratorily, remember we talked about with, with spike proteins, they'd attach to respiratory linings. And most of the time when you activated these receptors, they would produce agents that were anti-inflammatory in nature. They would stimulate normal reparative processes that would dilate uh, bronchi and would, would, would produce materials that were less likely to cause problems. And what happened, these receptors were sort of hijacked and began to produce what we would call pro-inflammatory cytokines. These are chemical agents that provoke inflammation and, and at the same time provoke uh, bronchoconstriction, difficulty breathing, accumulation of fluids in the lungs, and this, this really bizarre respiratory kind of pneumonia that's immediately life-threatening. And that happened particularly in people. So it was very easily spread, particularly if they were in close quarters. So there's, a, there's a whole lot of nuances to this if you want to get into it. And, and we had, at least in my opinion, a comparative rush to formulate a vaccine that may or may not be, and I, don't, I personally do not think it's as effective as they would have it cracked up to be. Because we see too many cases where they do, they thought we're fond of calling breakthrough cases. People who were vaccinated, you all know them, who were vaccinated and got COVID. You know, not a whole lot of people are getting, you know, get polio anymore because it's an efficient vaccine. So when you rush to produce something, you don't have enough, if you want to call it that, due diligence in order for it to be necessarily effective. So uh, that's not a knock uh, uh, against trying to cope with something, but there's, there's a whole lot of layers to what went, went on. And, and, and unfortunately now, I think, unfortunately, because I think it's changed the world dramatically. It certainly changed our approach to education very, very much so. But nevertheless, that's sort of the nugget when it comes to this. So these are respiratory viruses. They're enveloped, so they're relatively easy to deal with on surfaces. And so that should give you a certain amount of reassurance. Uh, I personally think more than anything else. But are we going to see variations? Yes. Are the current variations, that are the nuances that we're seeing mutations in COVID are becoming more and more like 
we're going to have certain ones that are less problematic and certain ones are more problematic. And no, I don't think we need to be immunized every time a new strain comes out. But, you know, that, that makes pharmaceutical companies a lot of money. Let's be clear. It does. And if you did not know, they are indemnified. That's a fancy word that means you can't sue them if you get that shot and you end up, or a loved one ends up dying. They are indemnified. That's pretty, you know, they, they would tell you that that is done to, you know, to make sure that they're willing to produce these agents. But the reality is, you do, it, it, it changes the ability of having any legal recourse in that area. That's a very interesting thing. It's like saying, well, I'm having an operation. I can't sue the doctor if they, uh, pardon the expression, F up. Well, that's not right. I don't think so. But, hey, I don't make the laws. So, so much for that. All right. So that's an interesting, so I thought, I think we wanted to share that nugget as we go through these other RNA viruses. And some of these don't mutate a lot comparatively, or they don't change significantly. And really the earliest virus that we studied was something that was around and was, was a problem in the earliest days when Pasteur, who really formulated the first idea of being able to treat rabies. Rabies is, has a broad range, it affects multiple species. Nearly all mammals are affected by that, including the aforementioned bats. And that's where a lot of people have to be very cautious when they do things like going caving, if they like to do that, where there's a, where, where, where bats tend to hang out and there's a lot of bat urine and that's very, and bat droppings that are particularly rich a lot in a lot of substances, including viruses that could be quite harmful. And that's, and so we call it rhabdoviridae short for rabies is the best way to describe it. We all know it affects multiple species that are there. And the presumption that you have to make, if you are, let's say, bitten by an animal, unless you know that it has been vaccinated for rabies, you have to presume that you have been exposed to rabies. Okay. Very simply. And that where do we see this? For years, there was a series of injections that were given that were almost intolerable and was the only treatment that we had for rabies. Okay, it was a rabies series that was given over two weeks. They were intraperitoneal injections. They injected them in the abdomen. They were extraordinarily painful. Okay, now that has changed. Now they have improved. Uh, the makeup of those vaccines and they're given in a more traditional, they're not vaccines rather, but the, uh, basically they're injections of antibodies or antiviral antibodies that are done. And people who tend to get them are people who work typically for veterinarians and veterinarians themselves are the ones who are more involved in that. But that was a nasty series. And again, this is the interesting thing. We all think about this as being a classic zoonotic, because that is the way it's usually spread from another manner of the animal kingdom to us. Okay? Not entirely. So for all of you future nurses, uh, a neighbor of my first wife's mom and dad, and we lived up the street with them for a couple of years. She was a psych nurse at St. Francis. St. Francis is the, was the hospital that is located where the current children's hospital is in, in Pittsburgh. Okay? In... It, it basically in that neck of the woods that's there that big facility they built really was from saint saint francis had a very large psych unit and a very large drug and alcohol detox unit so it was it was a big player and that's where they made i was on staff at saint francis i operated out of the saint francis hospital okay what happened she was a psych nurse and I had a guy who was basically crazy. She's trying to take care of and all a doctor lector she bent over and he took a chunk out of her. He bit her. And subsequently he died. In the postmortem, they discovered he had rabies. So she had to be treated for rabies. So that was really the underlying feature of his psychiatric disorder. The moral of the story is be careful for those of you who are doing patient care because patients, you get a lot of secretions, I'm being kind, end up on you in a lot of ways. Just, just noting that. You will be spat upon, shat upon, potentially urinated upon, and God only knows what else upon. Just want to let you know about that. Going in. So 
and these days, occupationally, you do need to report all of those things should those events occur, because that's where occupational health comes in. And your only protection, if that does happen to you and you're in an environment, in a medical environment, is an incident report. You need to do that needs to be done. And don't let any supervisor tell you, oh, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Don't do that. That's not their call. That's your call. They don't have to like you. And there's plenty of, and, for, and particularly for nursing, there's plenty of need out there. If they don't want you to work at that place. Go work in another place. Stuff it. Nevertheless, that's the saga of rabies. Affects multiple species. We have to be concerned about that in the area here. So let's just look at it around here. You do have to be careful. And, and, and this is particularly for little kids, uh, squirrels, chipmunks, foxes, you, you name it. They're all potentially rabid that are there. I can remember to this day, my daughter, when, when we had like a thing that was from the North Hills Y, where we went to like a Y camp and it was dads and daughters and we had a bunch of chipmunks and all they could think was go up and pet the chipmunks. I'm like, you know, chasing them away. They all say to think they were Simon and Theodore and Alvin. Chipmunks. Squeakle. I was around when they, when they first started doing things musically in the late fifties, by the way. Nevertheless, be watchful of that. Ebola. Ebola is something that had never occurred in this country. It, and we, the presumption was that it came fecal to oral and typically an animal that had Ebola died and fouled the water supply in a native village. And everybody used the same well or the same water supply. That was the idea. And the problem with Ebola was way back when I started teaching about this 20 plus years ago, was this was the way you had phrased it. Basically, what they did was they quarantined the village. They isolated the people there. And the expression was for the health players, they let the disease burn itself out. That's code for letting everybody who's infected either die or survive. And just keep them away from everybody else until eventually the survivors, all that's left are the survivors and they're not going to be a problem. And then you try to deal with the water supply, whatever it was. The death rate was about 80%. We now know that there are better treatments available and in equatorial Africa, where there have been several outbreaks like in Liberia and in that neck of the woods toward the Ivory Coast in that area most recently. And it did happen to impact some folks who were doing like Doctors Without Borders or medical missions that were there. So much so that one of the doctors was infected and a couple of other people were brought back to this country for treatment. Again, it's an enveloped virus. People were, but we learned a lot more about how it spread to the point where even in these, what they called hospitals, which are basically facilities that probably had dirt floors where there were a lot of people, there's plenty of, plenty of images about this and videos about this that were all over the news about five, six years ago. You could probably have a doctor or a nurse work in there for about 45 minutes, all with, you know, it's super hot. You're in the middle of the jungle, just about, you know, in a very, very warm area and you're covered in gloves and face protective gear and gowns and everything. So they had about 45 minutes when they would leave it. They, it, it wasn't, they needed several people to be for them to be decontaminated upon leaving. You needed one person who just read exactly what you're supposed to do. You had someone else performing the decontamination. You had to remove the gear in a specific way to avoid self-contamination. That's how careful it had to be. And so when they brought these people who were infected over to our country to be treated, because we had more sophisticated treatments, a lot of places tried to say, oh, we can handle this. Well, Emory University was fine. That was where the most successful treatment was. They brought somebody to Dallas who said that they in a hospital, I don't know what the hospital was, and ended up getting people, other people infected. When the nurse was infected, you have to staff has to be trained appropriately and everything else. And it's not that you, whether you encounter this or not, I don't know, but you do have to. It's very, very important for any of these highly contagious diseases, 
we now know that the death rate is less and we we're you know now we're pretty sure that there are other ways that this is passed in addition to being fecal to oral you know there's a certain contact that's oh that's potential is there a respiratory component has there been some type of mutation of these viruses so ebola is interesting but up until a few years ago we'd never had a, a case in this country it only had one because we brought ostensibly brought people back to be treated here but there's been nothing since so it's a, it's a very scary kind of a virus that you will see with regard to it. it used to be one called marburg but we really think that's just a variant of ebola they were in, and they're filoviridae so both rhabdo and philo are those helical or filamentous viruses they're not isometric at all that are there the ones that are a little unusual and where orthomixo is is fairly clearly isometric the paramixo is probably more in the filamentous shape and these are interesting they again these are all enveloped viruses that we're dealing with these are mixo means mucus so para meant alongside of and ortho meant straight i don't know how they came upon those particular names paramixo is famous for four different diseases that you should be familiar with and I mentioned them in passing before the measles mumps and interestingly these are both sped respiratorily but they affect different systems when we get to them measles impact effectively their their presentation on the skin they're classified by the system they affect the most they are skin disease okay and mumps even though it's respiratory is classified as being an enteric disorder in other words it affects something with your digestive system because it targets glandular tissue particularly salivary glands particularly parotid glands and and we'll go into that in, in a certain amount of detail down the line so that's the two mm's of mmr and the other one we talked about was a toga virus which is rubella because they have significant complications particularly in adults children tolerate high fever and the problems that fairly well like as a kid we all like I said we had measles the only one I didn't have was mumps and I was immunized for the mumps when just before I was getting married the first time back in 1978 and it basically uh, it was more it was more precaution in the idea that we were trying to have children and that was, it was basically to avoid that because the mumps particularly in adult men can impact glandular tissue read that as testicular tissue and cause infertility or stroke so that it was kind of watched so the doctor who gave me the shot was my wife's guy you know ob gyne and he, and he goes like hey next three months whatever precautions you are you no know, one anybody getting pregnant etc etc so measles mumps something called para influenza which is a, let's say a more mild flu presentation and a big time player now rsv respiratory one of the big 3 in the winter around here covid influenza and respiratory syncytial virus which is was for years known as the infantile respiratory disease because it really affected preemies and it affected very very young children much more than any, than any other syncytial if you you probably did the cardiac unit already in a and p in lab or in lecture right so a syncytium is what the heart muscle is all the cells are interconnected so syncytium is a fusion or an interconnection of cells this virus does that to your lung not good okay, so it fuses cells that are affected together so they can't function okay and therefore breathing it, it why is such a problem in newborn and I don't know if you did the respiratory unit but if you didn't uh preemies up roughly around age 26 weeks of gestation start to make something called surfactant that comes from type 2 cells in the lung that's a wetting agent that allows the allows the meat of the lung the alveoli and the cells not to stick to one another and so now before it was a death sentence now we can make surfactant in the laboratory and there's a much more optimistic range for premature infants i mean anything under 26 weeks years ago was they were just not going to survive this is one of the ones that affected it in older kids and my kids all had this 
Okay, and we're talking about toddlers. It causes a very interesting, scary disease for parents called the croup. And if you're a parent and your kid has the croup, you think, oh my God, because in the middle of the night, all of a sudden you hear this, this sound that's like some, a cross between a whistle and the strangest cough you ever heard. And you're sure that your kids aren't going to make it to the night. And the treatment for years, now we have cool mist vaporizers and things like that. What we used to do when my, my kids were a little older, you know, they're not little anymore, was we ended up, I ended up, because my wife was, was one of those people, well, you have to do it because I can't get back to sleep if I get up and I won't have enough sleep. So I had to empty the kitty litter every time. She was a great toxoplasmosis. Sorry, she's a nice person, just weren't meant to be married. After 28 years, you know, we figured that out. It was a long time. Okay. Yeah, I've been happily married for 10 years. Yeah, 10 out of 28 isn't bad. <laughs> no joke. But nevertheless, when we would put them in, we would put them in, in the bathroom, turn on the shower, close the doors and the windows, and turn it kind of turn into a steam room. And I would sit there with them until they could breathe again. <laughs> I digress. So those are the paramyxo. They're all spread respiratorily. This one, the Ebola, we don't know. This, we assume it's zoonotic, but again, it could be person to person. The Ebola, not sure, originally was thought to be fecal to oral, but probably there's more ways than that that it spread. These are all respiratory, as is influenza. Influenza we'll deal with on a couple of notes, and it's the same thing as COVID, in the sense that it is a very unique kind of arrangement of a virus. So it's an enveloped virus, and the spikes are on the outside, like so. Okay, and what it has inside is the only one where it has a sort of a unique kind of strandedness. It has seven to eight single strands of RNA that are pretty much usually identical. And what they do is those strands of RNA code, code for two types of spikes. Okay, there are two types of spikes. So you one, you can do a circle and a square and basically alternate them around. And they're around the entirety of this effectively spherical virus. So you, you always see them two-dimensional. Those spikes code for two kinds of proteins. One is called, and I always get the spelling wrong, neuraminidase, and the other one calls, is codes for something called hemagglutinin. And those are long names, and okay? inconvenient to remember. So we call them N and H. We've identified about, I don't know, around 15 to 17 different variations of H and maybe five to nine variations of N, more or less, and the numbers are always changing. What happens is that there's a phenomenon, you remember, I was telling you about something called antigenic shift, where different species, you get little pieces of, of RNA that shift from species to species within another species. Here, this is called drift. And we'll go over this a couple of times. It's like a little segment from here moves to here and it kind of flip flop. And what it does is it alters the spike. And by altering the spike, it causes a variation in the virus, albeit subtle. It doesn't make, make it necessarily more nasty, but the way vaccines are made, like influenza vaccine or COVID vaccine, is to a particular strain of the virus. And effectively, what the vaccine is something that's designed to produce a specific antibodies. Antibodies work by basically attacking those spikes. Okay, so you're producing antibodies that will basically obstruct those spikes from attaching the receptors on susceptible cells. And by altering those spikes, it's like the antibodies designed to basically attached to a spike like this. If all of a sudden the spike has a mutation and it's like this, it doesn't attach. Inefficient. And so with influenza, those vaccines, sometimes they work great, sometimes they don't because they have to make a new one every year 
for usually the three or four strains that are most likely to infect you. Typically, they're trivalent or polyvalent vaccines. And so it's based on epidemiology. They look at what's going on. Basically, weather patterns are such that diseases from the Far East kind of come this way over time and work their way across the country. And so they'll pick out the strains that are most likely to be problematic. Construct a vaccine, takes about six months to make it. And hopefully they get it right. If they don't, if it mutates in transit and it mutates all the time, they're less effective sometimes. So I, when I, I, the last time I got a flu shot, I got the flu. I can remember my doctor going, Hey, you know, you have the flu. He goes and looks back. Hey, he gave you a flu shot in September. I said, yep. That was it for my flu shots. Thank you very much. If it's not going to work, why am I doing that? So that's influenza. So you're going to hear when we talk about influenza, H1N1, H5N1, H1N3. The last time we had a significant influenza outbreak that was impactful here was about 2009 and it was an H1N1 swine flu. The swine indicates that there was a, it was a pig, whatever, hog, pig, something component that was in there. See, wouldn't have, it would have, kosher wouldn't have affected me, though. No. I'm not kosher. Please. In my household, you can't do that. My wife is addicted to bacon. She just is. She goes to Bacon Anonymous. Hi, I'm Patty. I'm a bacon addict. I haven't been sober ever. Nevertheless, what's going on with regard to that is that, and I recall my middle one had that back in 09. So uh, he was, I guess, 25 then. I mean, so it, it was, it, by the time they made the diagnosis, he was, in, he was at the hospital in Monroeville where he was living at the time. I mean, I literally almost had to carry him back to his apartment. And I picked him up at that. I mean, he was just a mess. And, and that was, they used the Tamiflu and all that. But if you, and we'll get to that with antivirals. If you don't get that stuff started early, within the first like 24 to 48 hours, it doesn't work too well. So he was probably, he was just, just clobbered for about, for about two or three weeks with that. And that was one of those interesting ones. And we'll get into why it does that that affected young, relatively healthy individuals, as opposed to typical influenza, which is much more about the elderly or the very young, or usually the most susceptible. But that's the nugget on influenza. There's different kinds of influenza viruses. They're all spread respiratorily. Uh, again, it's enveloped, so it's very, very easy to get rid of it on surfaces. Uh, it's kind of taken a back seat in the sense that everybody's so COVID alert that it makes you wonder why they're not reporting quite as many influenza. That's just me. Almost done with, with most of this material here this morning because I did want to try to get through it. We have plenty of time. Because the last ones are not that big of the deal. Lhasa doesn't, as far as I know, has never been in this country and I don't really have enough expert information. Hanta is interesting. Hanta is a deadly pulmonary virus originally from... Again, from the African subcontinent, from equatorial Africa, it's associated, and this is important because we see it in this country, with rat or mouse droppings, with rodent droppings. Rodent droppings and fungi are the same thing, are very easy to spread because they aerosolize. This is what's called an airborne. Airborne is different than droplet. A common cold is a droplet spread, and we get into this later. What does that mean? Somebody coughs or sneezes with a cold in class. In a couple of minutes, that drops to the floor. That's meant by a droplet. I mean, somebody walks in, does you know, walks through it, it'll kick it up a little bit. That's there. Airborne means consistently up in the air, a greater risk of inhaling. Hanta is airborne. That's because the the for whatever reason, the combination of this virus and the, the, whatever kind of uh, rodent excrement may, tends to make that. And we see that, where do we see that? Where there's a lot of rodents and it's very, very windy. Read that as the desert Southwest. 
And you'll see that that is the same thing is true for some airborne fungal infections, one called valley fever, which we will get to. It used to be called San Joaquin Valley fever. Okay, so there's, there's nothing new under the sun. If you live in Arizona, New Mexico, uh, you know, lower California, those areas, those desert areas, that four corner area, you're all familiar with this. So this is one of the things they have to be careful. If you've ever been out there, when it gets windy and dusty, it is very, very visible. I remember we were out in Joshua Tree uh, National Park, and I mean, when all of a sudden the wind starts to go, and you have all those like dust devils and dirt devils, whatever they call them. Oh my God, it's scary. It was like 105 out there. We were out there one summer. So, nevertheless, that's one of the things that we did. Now, we don't, occasionally there'll be a cases in the city areas or around here. Those are typically where, where, there's, where there's been problems with rat control or rodent control or in laboratories where they're, you'd make, where they're basically growing rodents, you know, for experimentation. Where we begin to see those things. So that's hantavirus. That's interesting in and of itself. Uh, hepatitis DNA. We used to think it was a DNA virus. That's where it got its name for hepatitis B. We now know it is a reverse transcription virus where DNA is re effectively rewritten, you know, into it. Okay. It's a little hard to explain. It's not that important compared to today. Worldwide, hepatitis B is a significant factor. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C are both viruses that lead directly to cancer. They impact the lining, you know, basically impact, not the lining, but the liver cells, which are called hepatocytes. They are as highly reproductive as any cell that we have. You can regrow your liver or a good part of it. That's why we can do live liver transplants. It used to only be from people who were deceased where you could transplant. That's not the case anymore. So when cells are that rapid metabolically and mitotically, it is, it is relatively easy to contract a virus that potentially will start to damage that whole cell line. That's what hepatitis does. <laughs> so hepatitis B, we have an immunization for it. It's been very successful. It's been around for quite a while. It's made genetically, interestingly enough, when I was in, it had come out, and people who worked in healthcare or worked in a doctor's office all had to either be had to either be immunized or have the opportunity to be to decline the immunization. They didn't have to get it, but they had to be offered it. I had to, I and the employer me had to pay for it, which I did for my staff way back. This was in the, in the early nineties, let's say. As I, I'm trying to recall which office I when we, when we were having that discussion. I'm, I think it was the early nineties when that was the case, when that, when that was happening. So I'll look at it again, just to see if I can see any nuances with the, with the way it is reverse transcribed. But the one I want to do, we want to spend the rest of our time on is here. And that's human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. And the biggest mistake people make in understanding this, and it's been around for a while, is the fact that somebody is HIV positive is A, not fatal. B, not a death sentence, which means not fatal. I was reiterating the same point. Treatable. Okay. And, it, and it's unlikely that they're going to spread it to you by, by any kind of contact. Even, even comparatively speaking, intimate contact. Okay. It depends on their viral load. And load means how many virus particles are in their secretions, whether it's bloodstream, genital urinary secretions, saliva, etc. Okay. And only really people with AIDS have very, very high levels, but people who are being treated who are HIV positive, they monitor those things, particularly for any kinds of intimacy that they are going to have. So it's, it's one of the first things to understand. It is a very unusual virus. And I'm going to find where I saw, it was like one of those like discovery or science channels. And what had happened, this is why there's a lot of vaccine distrust in equatorial Africa, which I've mentioned a lot of time. They tried to do a polio vaccine thing back in the early 60s when it first came out. And they have actual footage of the, quote, laboratory in the Congo, what it was. It's not 
It's not like the micro lab, not even that clean. Dirt floors, they grew it in monkeys, whatever, whatever species that they had captured, didn't care if the monkeys were sick or not. They were in cages, you know, urinating, defecating on one another. The monkeys were sick. The floors were dirt. It was garbage. And they're growing it in that, and they're trying to grow polio virus. And the, and the theory is that these monkeys had polio, which is an RNA virus, had another virus, and somehow the combination created this novel virus we call HIV. And HIV is sort of what I like to call the worst of both wor worlds. It is an RNA virus, so it mutates all the time. Yet, because it's rewritten initially into DNA, sometimes it incorporates and effectively becomes latent, or at the very least, alters the existing genome, mutates it, causes cancer, changes whole cell lines. And it affects the single most important cell in our immune system. And if you didn't do the immunology unit, or if you did, that is called the helper T cell, which is called the CD4. That's the name of the antigenic marker. That's also where the virus attaches, effectively the receptor protein. The helper T cell is just what it names you. Everything in your immune system is based on the helper T cell. It helps your existing immunity, it helps your innate immunity, it helps your adaptive immunity. And what it does is effectively it alters that cell line. And so all helper T cells eventually become dysfunctional. Once they reach a critical level of not being present under X hundred, I think it's 200 per microliter that, that we see, at that point, your immune system collapses. And that's the transition from HIV positive. And HIV positive just means that you're registering a positive titer or level for the antibody. So it's pretty interesting in that regard. And what happens, it has a very unique, and these are all stages where we try to attack it. So it comes in as RNA. And that RNA is then rewritten to DNA. It does that because it has a magic enzyme incorporated called reverse transcriptase. Formally, it's called RNA reverse transcriptase. Then from the DNA, it becomes messenger RNA as it takes over the cell. And then it begins to make a variety of proteins all in one chain. So you have a chain that makes capsid proteins, spike proteins, and more reverse transcriptase all attached to one another. Got a fancy name called a polyprotein. So it's like a long strand like this. So you have to chop it up to get all the components. And there's another enzyme that comes to the party along with it called protease. Okay, and that basically cleaves the polyprotein. And then it assembles. And it's enveloped, so it's relatively easy. So this is a very unique transcription strategy. So you have here, this is where mutations occur. Because RNA making DNA is an area where there's no real surveillance that goes on inside one of our cells that are there. So you have... <coughs> different areas, and we'll get into more nuances of it as time go on, goes on, where we can interfere. So we have inhibitors for this. We have agents that are here, a lot of anti-metabolites. This is the typical frontline unit, what I call lookalike drugs. These are altered DNA and RNA bases that become incorporated. They're part of the first line treatment. We have protease inhibitors. A lot of times the DNA will incorporate, okay, and we have agents that prevent that from incorporating with a host cell, the CD4 cell. 
So those are, so we utilize something called an integrase, because it integrates is the term that we use, integrase in humans. So there's a, and there's even something up, up above to stop it from getting there called entry inhibitors. So there's, it's been studied a lot. For the longest time, you see, when, when it came out, to give you historically, HIV came out and everybody thought, oh, this is, this is some you know, plague that's designed to affect gay people. You know, because there's something inherently wrong, which is the, the most stupid thing you ever heard. Okay, and what happened was there was very little research done, and it wasn't until some very well-known people in the entertainment industry, Rock Hudson, an action hero star, like the, like you know this this handsome male leading man type guy, and Liberace, who most people thought was a little different anyway, but was easily the most popular entertainer in, in Las Vegas. Okay, both succumbed to AIDS, okay, and at that point, the powerful people, read that as a lot of money, in the entertainment industry, basically told their, all the people in politics and said, you do something about this now, and in 1988, they created something called the Orphan Drug Act, that was an in inducement to fast track medicines, not for orphans, but for conditions that didn't affect a lot of people. And that's what sort of brought the whole treatment. And we began to increase our understanding. And then important figures, Magic Johnson, you know, ostensibly from some type of you know, multiple heterosexual contacts, you know, became this, and I mean, and, and, and is perfectly healthy, more or less to this day, but he's been treated with, with antivirals for the last, it was like 1993, I'm thinking, for the last 30 years. So there's a lot to it. And as I said, we were seeing this condition in Philadelphia where I was working, and was, you know, educating and was a resident for six years early on before it made an, it wasn't, until, we didn't know about it until 1981. We were seeing cases in the mid seventies all the time about this, a fascinating disease. So that's what it is. So it's a retrovirus. We're going to explore it more in sexually transmitted diseases. You'll probably get a little bit of coverage in this when you do immunology and AP2. And boy, that's enough for today. Have fun. See you all on Friday. <laughs>